Report of the Society's 2,376 meeting in the 146th year since its founding in 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I'm the president of PSW, the oldest scientific society of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members and guests to tonight's lecture by Reed Beeman. We'll begin with a few announcements, followed by a reading of the minutes of the 2,375th meeting, and a few notes on notable activities of some of our members. We will then turn to this evening's lecture, followed by a question and answer period. Thereafter, I will present a small thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements, and then adjourn the meeting to the social hour. Please join me in thanking the sponsors of the Fall 2016 and Spring 2017 Lecture Series, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University, and a generous anonymous donor. I am pleased to announce that the following new members have been elected. Thomas Keelan, a researcher at the Hudson Institute who is particularly interested in artificial intelligence and who found PSW on the web. And tonight's speaker, Reed Beeman, whose interests will be obvious from tonight's proceedings. Please join me in welcoming them to the society. <laughs> if any of our new members are here tonight, besides the speaker, Please see me to pick up your reprint of volume one of the PSW Bulletin, where you can learn something about PSW's founders and why they chose to name it the Philosophical Society of Washington. A few notes on member activities of interest. Members Kirby Runyon and Alan Stern have been in the news lately for a recent pub published article proposing a new definition of planet based on mass and morphology. The article appeared in Lunar and Planetary Science, volume 48, 1448.pdf, a modern citation. It considered all the known solar system bodies that have some properties associated with planets and those that clearly do not. The definition reproduced here is simple enough, a subcellular mass body. I'm sorry, I'm a molecular biologist. <laughs> a substellar mass body that has never undergone nuclear fusion and that has sufficient self-gravitation to assume a spheroidal shape adequately described by a triaxial ellipsoid regardless of its orbital parameters. The definition is encapsulated in the article as follows. Round objects in space that are smaller than stars. Both Alan and Kirby worked on New Horizons. Alan was a prime mover and principal investigator on the project. And they no doubt have decided opinions on Pluto's planetary status. The new definition not only embraces Pluto, certainly justified by New Horizons revelations that Pluto is a complex, and highly dynamic object, but also elevates more than 100 other bodies in the solar system to planetary rank. Well, the definition is a great simplification. I have to say I shudder at the thought of the schools requiring their students to know all the new planets' names by the time they graduate from sixth grade. Hopefully we'll hear from Kirby himself about this in the not too distant future. I have to say, I'm sorry that you can't see all the stars in the sky above the tent, but it's really quite a beautiful picture. Pre Recording Secretary Preston Thomas, in the best traditions of the society, has recently returned from his expedition to climb Mount Kilimanjaro and measure parameters of acclimation during ascent and descent, which he will describe for us in a moment. I have to say that Kilimanjaro is Dangerous. Approximately 1,000 people are evacuated from the mountain every year, and approximately 10 deaths are reported. 
the real number is probably 20 to 30. Main cause of death is altitude sickness. But we're fortunate. Preston came back in one piece, hale and hearty, and ready to tell us all about it. Preston? With the Society's indulgence, I will present a brief report on the ascent of Mount Kilimanjaro and some notable observations made there. Tanzania, as many of you know, is located on the east coast of Africa, where it is known for its wildlife preserves of the Serengeti and Ngorongoro Crater, as well as the Great Rift Valley and Olduvai Gorge, one of the most important paleoanthropological sites in the world. The country name is a portmanteau of Tanganyika and Zanzibar, which united in 1964 to form a new country known variously and co-equally by its citizens as Tanzania or Tanzania. Mount Kilimanjaro is a dormant volcano, one of the seven summits, and is the highest freestanding mountain in the world with a summit height of 5,895 meters or 19,341 feet. The crew consisted of nine climbers assisted by invaluable and dedicated local porters and guides without whom ascent of Kilimanjaro is not possible or nearly as enjoyable. Following Limosho, the newest route, I am pleased to report that our expedition reached the summit at 5.43 a.m. on March 5th, 2017 to a glorious sunrise, which at that elevation occurs approximately an hour earlier than at ground level. Contrary to the hyperbolic accounts of some guides and climbers, it is not geometrically possible to perceive the curvature of the earth from the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro. The climbers were from England, Australia, Canada, and the United States, and ranged in age from 25 to 59. Of the nine climbers, eight achieved the summit. One reached 5,500 meters before being forced to turn back due to exhaustion and the onset of altitude sickness. Compared to sea level, barometric pressure and available oxygen dropped by half at 5,500 meters, approximately 18,000 feet. This reduction results in hypobaric hypoxia and can develop into acute mountain sickness, high altitude pulmonary edema, and high altitude cerebral edema, which are fatal and represent the primary danger of mountaineering at high, high elevations. Given time, the body can acclimatize to elevation. Anecdotally, acclimatization via graded ascent is well known as the best way to avoid these risks. However, there is scant empirical data to quantify the benefit of relatively short one to five day acclimatization periods such as those involved in Kilimanjaro ascents. Mindful of my obligation to the society, I prevail upon the other climbers to obtain a copy of the blood oxygen saturation and resting pulse rate data collected each morning and evening by the guides to monitor for symptoms of altitude sickness. If effective acclimatization begins within days, we would expect blood oxygen saturation to decline substantially when first exposed to elevation followed by relative improvements in blood oxygen saturation over the next several days as the body acclimatizes to a given elevation. Analysis of the data from our expedition included comparing pairs of oxygen saturation measurements taken at comparable elevations on days one and seven and on days two and six of the ascent. In both cases, the data demonstrated that the second set of measurements showed improvements in blood oxygen saturation substantially exceeding statistical significance. Moreover, the data suggested potential homeostatic constant in the ratio of elevation to oxygen saturation that was not here to have identified in the literature on acclimatization. Thus, our data confirmed the longstanding recommendation that even relatively short acclimatization periods are effective at reducing the effects of elevation and delaying or reducing the symptoms of altitude sickness, validating the traditional Kilimanjaro mantras of pole pole, meaning slowly, slowly, and of course, hakuna matata, meaning no worries. <laughs> As you can see here, we have the actual data. I don't want to belabor the point, but um, on this chart, you can see that um, as the climbers go up, the oxygen saturation goes down, starting at approximately sea level of uh, 96 or 97 percent for the average. That's what you probably all have right now. And declining to um, a low on, for the average of uh, 87, and for some of the climbers, uh, 80 or 82. I should point out that if you show up in an emergency room with an oxygen saturation of less than 92, 
the first thing they will do is give you oxygen. And this demonstrates the directly inverse relationship between elevation as it goes up and oxygen as it goes down. Uh, we did not take oxygen measurements at the summit, but there was enough data to project what it would have been, which is not good at all. Um, so the amount of time you're allowed to spend on the summit is, is essentially limited to 15 minutes or half an hour uh, before they bring you down, um, hopefully before your body realizes that it's up that high. So uh, that is a brief report on the ascent of Mount Kilimanjaro, respectfully submitted. Preston Thomas, Recording Secretary. Are there any questions? I'll take one. There are no questions. Ah, there's a question. Uh oh. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, did you include in those calculations the one person who actually did suffer from severe altitude sickness? Because it sounds like that might be an outlier. Um, I don't think they're an outlier. I think they're perfectly representative of their uh, their age and their fitness level. Mm -hmm. um, they are the blue. Uh, let's see. Uh, the dark blue dot, the one along the bottom. J. Yeah, J. Okay. Um, and he, he made it quite a ways, uh, again, uh, 5,500 meters, 18,000 feet, so uh, just about half the oxygen, uh, which is, it's, that's considered an accomplishment anywhere. I wasn't trying to put him down. I was just okay. curious if he was an outlier yeah. for the rest uh, of your day. I, I think he, was, he would uh, not be considered a statistical outlier and uh, is uh, at, at 59, was um, one of the older climbers, but certainly not the oldest to summit while we were there. Thank you. One more question. Oh, one more. Good. Hello? Yes. Uh, Bob Bayer, I'm a member. Uh, were you all taking the same medications, diamox, steroids, whatever? Yes, uh, diamox, acetazolamide uh, is commonly prescribed. Um, there hasn't been good data until very recently, but uh, the, the, the jury is back. And yes, acetazolamide does help, uh, taken in uh, 250 milligrams per day. Typically twice a day if you're in America, 250 milligrams uh, in one tablet if you're not. Um, and it, uh, it, does, it seems uh, better than placebo by about 40%. Uh, so if you can stand the tingling hands and the frequent urination, I would recommend it for anyone. But I, when you were all taking it, I just wondered if the oh. um, the, the person who didn't uh, make it was taking it, and uh, two of the people that did make it weren't taking it. Uh, so it certainly is only one factor. It's not at all determinative, um, but uh, it's a factor. Preston will now read the minutes of the previous meeting's lecture on Saving the Planet, the Quest to Combat Cultural Racketeering by Deborah Lair. I will keep this brief so as not to take up too much time at the podium tonight. At the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C. on March 10, 2017, President Larry Milstein called a 2,375th meeting of the Society to order at 8.10 p.m. He announced the order of business and welcomed new members. President Milstein presented a summary of the 36th meeting of the Society held in 1872. The minutes of the previous meeting were read and approved. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Deborah Lair, the founder and chairman of the Antiquities Co Coalition. Her lecture was titled, Saving the Past, The Quest to Combat Cultural Racketeering. Ms. Lair began by inviting the audience to imagine a moment of uprising and protest in Washington, DC, in which thieves break into the Smithsonian and loot priceless cultural and historic artifacts, not just for personal gain, but in the calculated effort to harm our society by destroying art and antiquities we celebrate. This has become the constant reality in the regions threatened by the terrorist group ISIS, who used the destruction and plunder of historic sites and artifacts as a tool of war to frighten and demoralize local populations while bringing in millions of dollars to further their attacks. Although ISIS espouses an extremist view of Islam, the Antiquities Coalition has determined that almost 70% of the sites looted or destroyed by ISIS are in fact Islamic, more than the rest of the religious sites combined. Ms. Lair explained that cultural cleansing is a precursor to human genocide, and that attacks on historic and tourist sites are intended to undermine both social unity and the local economy, both of which benefit strongly from cultural capital. 
Ms. Lair recounted the story of Dr. Khalid al-Assad, dubbed the father of Palmyra, who curated, researched, and ultimately protected the ancient Syrian city until he was executed by ISIS for refusing to disclose the location of many of its hidden, hidden treasures. Looting of antiquities has joined oil theft and kidnapping as a top source of revenue for groups like ISIS. Although ISIS does destroy many sites, it has an institutionalized process for stripping them of valuable art and art artifacts. Records obtained by US Special Forces and the United States State Department indicate that ISIS income from looted antiquities reaches $5 million annually. This lucrative trade is facilitated by the fact that the United States Department of Justice has had a policy of seize and return for trafficked an antiquities, but rarely pursues criminal charges. Attitudes may be changing, however, as the FBI has recently announced it is actively investigating and bringing charges in the trade of conflict antiquities, and the United States recently signed a bilateral agreement with Egypt to close its market to Egyptian antiquities, and other Middle Eastern countries such as Libya, Tunisia, and Morocco have expressed interest in similar agreements. Dr. Lair concluded by acknowledging the parallels to the silver screen in which real life heroes battle tirelessly to save priceless antiquities, and she explained how individual collectors can help in the fight. After the conclusion of the talk, President Milstein invited questions from the audience. One questioner asked whether the impending capture of the ISIS capital of Raqqa, Syria, may diminish attention to conflict antiquities. Ms. Lair explained that the very visible pillaging and destruction by ISIS was clearly a factor in creating the impetus for international cooperation, but now that these structures are in place, they can be expected to continue to operate even if the focal point of the crisis shifts. Another questioner asked what, if anything, the governments of Israel and Turkey are doing about their country's role as hubs for trafficked antiquities. Ms. Lair explained that Israel is cooperating with the international community in attempting to intercept looted artifacts, but has made no move to change its long-standing law that legitimizes them if they do manage to enter the country. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 9.37 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the 2,375th meeting of the society to the social hour. Temperature, 1C. Weather, scattered clouds. Attendance, 81. Respectfully submitted, Preston Thomas, Recording Secretary. Thank you, Preston. Do we have any additions, corrections, or comments on the minutes? If not, I will accept a motion from a member to accept the minutes as read. Uh, second, all members in favor? Aye. The minutes are approved unanimously and will be posted to the website in due course. <clears throat> we now turn to tonight's lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Reed Beeman. Reed is a program director at the National Science Foundation with primary responsibilities for the collections in support of biological research and advancing digitization of biodiversity collections programs. Previously at NSF, he was responsible for several other programs, including Next Generation Networks for Neuroscience, Advances in Biological Informatics, Dimensions of Biodiversity, and critical techniques, technologies, and methodologies for advancing foundations and applications of big data sciences and engineering. Prior to joining NSF, he was curator of informatics at the Florida Museum of Natural History and associate director for informatics at the Yale Peabody Museum, working on digitization methods. Before that, he was postdoctoral fellow in Biological Informatics, sponsored by the Royal Botanic Gardens, Sydney, and the University of Kansas. Reed's research interests have focused on biodiversity studies, particularly in Southeast Asia, especially on Mount Kinabalu, a biodiversity hotspot on the island of Borneo. Among recent work, he has engaged with researchers in Asia as the bio diversity expedition lead for the Pro Pacific Rim Applications and Middleware Grid Applications Network project, a community of practice that facilitates cyber infrastructure experimentation on an international scale. 
This work continues the direction of his dissertation projects involving the description of eight new plant species and landscape level biogeographic analysis using remote sensing imagery and geographic information systems. Reed earned a BS in botany at the University of Michigan and a PhD in botany at the University of Florida. Please join me in welcoming Reed to the podium. So uh, thank you, Larry. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for, for inviting me to uh, speak at the, uh, at, at, at the Cosmo Club, the um, uh, Philosophical Society of Washington. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, um, I'm, as Larry mentioned, I'm here to talk about collections. Um, I've, as, as I think he mentioned, I worked on, on Mount Kinabalu for uh, a lot of my uh, student career, um, did, some, did some mountain climbing there and have experienced uh, altitude sickness myself. So uh, about six times uh, I climbed to the summit and every time I felt like uh, I could have easily passed out from, <laughs> from hypoxia. So anyways, um, I do want to, to uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, scientific collections, for the most part, collections that, that have been supported by the National Science Foundation and, and their new relevance to, to science and society um, as we go forward. Um, I would like to add, though, that you know, the, the, the uh, materials that I present tonight are um, my materials and they do not uh, uh, represent the, the, um, the official view of the foundation. So I think that, you know, one of the things that, that many of us in the collections community are somewhat sensitive about is, is, is that collections are sometimes just viewed as stamp collecting. Um, and my guess is that many of you have your own collections at home, whether they're art collections or, or, or coin collections, uh, stamp collections. Uh, um, but you know, you probably have, you're probably an expert in that particular area um, and, and see the value in what you have. Um, there's something human, humanly intrinsic about making collections and also and, and, and also classifying things, classifying things, but also organisms. Um, so, you know, while there could be an element of stamp collecting in, in making any kind of collection, I would sort of want, like you to consider and think about these two stamps, for example, these three stamps on here, how do we know exactly what's in those stamps? What are the organisms that, 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 that are represented by the Rafflesia stamp, the orangutan stamp, and the Malaysian tiger stamp? And, and so I will just add, so as part of uh, my background, um, and probably the thing that, the, 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 the thing that I uh, most enjoyed about my early career in science was that I studied this giant uh, flower Rafflesia, which is the largest flower in the world. Um, it's pollinated by carrion flies because, you know, it smells like rotting meat a bit. Um, so it's a charismatic flower. It's a parasite on, on, a, on, a, on a grapevine. Uh, 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 it's, not, it's not actually a grapevine, but um, it's in the family of grapes. It's a vine. And so the only part of the flower that you see that's exposed to, 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 to the external environment um, is, is the flower itself, the flower and, and the fruit when it's in fruit. Um, the rest of the plant is internal to, to the host. Um, and what I did was I studied the pollination ecology. And, and what was odd about this is that um, the, the way that the flies are tricked in, the carrion flies are tricked into getting a smattering of pollen from the male flowers is, is as intricate as what goes on in orchids. Um, 
But we did this, you know, I did this by, by burying myself in, in, in the, you know, leaf litter around uh, a flower of Rufilesia and just, we cut a window into it and basically watched what was going on inside that flower for, for, for hours and days. These things only for, flower for a little while and they only occur in Southeast Asia. But it, again, when you hear that there's a, there's a giant flower, the flowering arum flowering at the uh, National Botanic Garden here. It's actually not the largest flower in the world because those are made up of thousands of tiny microscopic flowers that you can't see. So it's Rafflesia that's the largest flower in the world. But how do we know that? Because we have, you know, we've, we've gone out there and studied uh, in the field and also made collections. And, and actually, Rafflesia has recently been in the news because of, of uh, the evidence of horizontal gene transfer from the um, from the uh, host to the to the uh, Rafflesia plant, and then you know the iconic figures of of of, of the Malaysian tiger and and also the orangutan. Um, you know, again, we really only know about these organisms and what they are because of of the long term study that's gone gone into them. So this is all about the study of biodiversity. Um, and, you know, it goes back to the work of Linnaeus and Darwin um, uh, through those ages. And so if I may borrow just the, the term um, or the definition um, from the Convention of Biological Diversity, um, it's not quoted here, but basically um, you can interpret it as that uh, the variety of all forms of life um, from genes to species and through the broad scale of ecosystems. So again, it's not just counting the number of species. Um, it's not just counting the number of, 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 of genera and families of things. It's, also, it's, it's all about understanding the relationship between the organisms that make up life on Earth. Um, and of course, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a study that's gone on for now hundreds of years. So, but it all goes back to describing species. Um, and Linnaeus again, um, it's, it goes back two to 300 years of, of description. And so the Systema nat Naturae, um, you know, describes Linnaeus' classification um, and you know, that's where, that's, that's where this all started. Um, and we've been doing it the same way for the last 300 years. But on the other hand, you know, that is one of the most basic things that we do as systematists, as, as, as biologists, but it's now not the only thing. So this is where the root of this, this work is, but um, not the end of it. Um, I do want to point out, you know, this, this, the, the types of Linnaeus, or the, 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 not the types, but the original collections of, of Linnaeus are, are, you know, available online. Um, Linnaeus was also a plant collector. And one thing that he did was that even when he was collecting things like fish, he would press them and dry them and, and, and glue them or, or, or attach them to sheets of paper. So um, that was one of the things that I just found quite amusing when, when, when I looked uh, through the collections here. And if you ever get a chance to visit the actual collections, um, uh, you should definitely do so. So the, the, the expeditions, you know, going back over the centuries, if you think about the cost um, and the, and, and, and the, in investments that went into those. Those were the moonshots. You know, the, the, they were expensive expeditions. They were dangerous. Um, you know, Darwin was sick all the time. Um, and, you know, it was, it was hard. It was a hard thing to do. Um, but again, you know, I haven't done the calculations. Um, I'm not an economist, but if you think about the costs in terms of today's dollars, it would probably be right along the lines of, of launching a spaceship and, and uh, to the moon. Um, but the 
The investments that have gone into the collections themselves over time have resulted in a treasure trove of data. Um, and, you know, those are expensive to maintain as well. Um, we're, um, the, they take up a lot of space. Oftentimes, you know, it's space that, the, the, you know, for example, with the Smithsonian, you know, it's right downtown Washington. It's prime real estate. Um, and so, you know, there's a sense that do we need to keep these things in this prime real estate or, you know, is it, should they move to, be moved off and into warehouses uh, where people can't see them? Well, that's, that's something that, you know, we, we, we discuss all the time. Um, it uh, is a matter of making collections available. Um, but, you know, digitization, I think, has, has and the techno technological advances in, in making data available, um, change that a little bit, but you still can't underscore the importance and the value of the actual collections themselves. These are one-off unique items um, for the most part. There are you know, many millions of them, if not billions of specimens, and not only do they you know, represent the, the scientific knowledge of, of, of the 20th and 21st century, but they also represent the local indigenous knowledge of, of natural systems. And, and this is something that is totally irreplaceable. We lose it um, as, we, as we lose um, uh, access to, to, to people and natural systems. So, Again, the old way of documenting distributions was simply to put dots on maps. And we get all that information, again, from the specimens. Um, and, you know, it seemed like that was one of the most valuable things to do um, even five, ten years ago. Um, it is important to know exactly where things come from. Um, it's demographics, basically. Um, but it tells us something about the ecosystems we live in. But, you know, that was a very simple use of collections data. Um, and some people might refer to it as just collections metadata. But it was the basis for, you know, working on, on monographs, um, floras, and, you know, the inventories that tell us where our rare endangered plants are, where, our, where, our, um, where invasive species are. Um, and, and so much more. But, you know, it's also a very basic process of putting dots on map. But it's very important. And, you know, the, the, the investment, so, so probably several of you, many of you have seen, you know, this, this, this recent paper showing the change, uh, changes in, in the um, uh, dinosaur classifications here, or the phy phy phylogenies. Um, I think that the, 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 the take-home message um, is not so much that, you know, there's a new classification here, is that our knowledge actually changes. It's a living, it's, 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 it's living data, um, and we need to think of it as such. So we need to be able to adjust to, to, to um, acquire new knowledge, new information about um, the organisms that, that, that um, are on Earth and have previously walked the Earth. But I think the other take-home message that I wanted to point out here is the fact that, that you know, the, the Ornithia clade, um, which are the birds, um, are part of the dinosaurs, and the, they're not extinct at all. You know, we think of dinosaurs as being extinct. But in fact, you know, the clade right in the middle of that is flying around us um, as we speak. And there's a whole lot of diversity. They may not be as big as some of the dinosaurs the, 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 that are now in our museums and still, you know, um, under, under, underground, underneath our feet. But there are a lot of them out there. Um, and and they're, they're alive today and they have feathers and they fly, many of them. So we don't necessarily need to, you know, think of dinosaurs as extinct. They're out there. But going back to the collection, so this is, this is a big long-term investment, again. So we spent, um, you know, the, 
set the stage there for, for, for 200, 300 years of collecting. There's a lot of habitat destruction going on, so we know that you, know, you can't go back to some of these places. The, 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 the ability to, to go back to some of the rainforests in, 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 in the South America and Africa um, and Southeast Asia, um, there's no opportunity. So it may be that you know, the collections remain the only repositories of some of these organisms. Um, and you know, there are somewhere between 1.5 and 10 million species of, 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 of organisms uh, other than the microbes. That's, that's perhaps you know, a completely different, uh, uh, there's, there's an argument, you know, there, it, you could, there may be, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions or hundreds of millions of species of, of microbes. I don't think we know yet um, because the methods of understanding microbial phylogenetics are still, I think, in flux. And, and oddly enough, you know, some microbes probably function as, as, as superorganisms as well. So I'm not even going to talk about the microbes. I'll leave that to to, to another speaker or another time. But um, the fact that we don't really know that, you know, there are either 1.5 million or 10 million named organisms tells you something. There are about um, 300,000 named plant species. And we also really don't, how many, don't know how many specimens we have in these collections. And we don't even know how many collections there are in, in, in the world. Um, you know, we don't know how many museums there are. So there's a whole lot of missing data here. Um, and you, you have to wonder why. There is a new effort to, to register all the collections um, in the world that's called GRBio. Um, but you know, the fact is that we still are missing an awful lot of information in terms of what we have, what we know about the natural world. Um, there are millions of pages of rare literature in the Biodiversity Heritage Library. Um, and again, you know, that represents the, 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 the knowledge, those, you know, the, the species descriptions that are, you know, they're published literature, but they're not easy, you know, it's not easy to have, um, to get access to them because a lot of them are stored in, in libraries and museums, squirreled away, and, 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 and there are not many copies of many of the rare literature. Um, so the, the, the Biodiversity Heritage Library is a good example of how you can get access to this online now. Um, and of course, there's link, there, there are the linkages between the literature and the collections. Um, but the nomenclatural description is a framework, um, an ontology framework, if you will, um, for communicating about organisms. And you know, I've, as, as, as a program officer at the National Science Foundation, I hear all the time about ontologies and how important they are. Um, usually it's something about the gene ontologies or the biomedical ontologies. Um, but the bottom line is somehow they all link um, back to these, these organisms and the specimens. And actually a lot of the literature on developing ontologies goes right back to Linnaeus. Linnaeus is used as an example of how to define an ontology on a, on a, on a regular basis. Um, so what is it about these specimens that makes them unique? What is, the, what is it that makes them about the, the makes them the gold standard? Um, so basically every specimen, um, you know, that's stored in a collection um, has a set of data or metadata about it. Um, so um, in this case, you know, this is, this is a pair of dragonflies, um, they're, they're, they're um, tawny um, sand dragon specimens um, from Florida from 1939. So there's a date there. Um, there's a description of, of, of where they're from. Um, so um, they're from Seminole County, Florida. Um, and there's a name on there. Um, so everything has uh, at least a name. It may not be the current name, um, but that's what our 
that's what our classifications and our, our, our ontologies are for. There's geographic data about it, um, and there is data about who collected it and when. So if a, a specimen, if a collection doesn't have that information, it's not really of value. So it's not really of scientific value. It may, be, it may have some aesthetic value. But if you don't know where it's from, what it is, and, 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 and when it was collected, um, it really isn't very valuable. So at the National Science Foundation, um, the Division of Biological Infrastructure has been, um, it's, it's, it's a division that's been around since the mid-'80s. Um, and collection support has been around at least that long. Um, and the, the current program that I run, uh, Collections in Support of Biological Research, um, funds the infrastructure. So we fund the improvement, the accessibility, um, and innovation in biological collections. So you may not think there's a lot of innovation there, but I'm going to try to convince you that, that there is. Um, and, you know, as important as the research is, um, it's also a teaching tool and, 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 and an outreach tool for public education. So we support both natural history collections and, and living stocks. And so when I you know, refer to living stocks, it's, you know, anything from, from, from microbial stocks to, to um, the lemur center. Um, and I'll say a little, I'll, I'll say more about each of those things. I have, um, uh, some of the next set of slides here are examples um, from our awards that we've made um, in the CSBR program. Um, so it just gives you an example of uh, a sample of uh, or a virtual tour, if you will. I think you know you have what, we have one of the most renowned collections um, just down the street here, and I don't know how many of you have have ever um, toured the the back rooms of of the museum, but and if you haven't, you know some of you may work there, but if you haven't been in the back of the museum where all the specimens are stored. Now, I definitely encourage you to, 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 to find someone to take you on a tour um, because it's truly amazing. Um, that is one, it's a national treasure um, and it's certainly you know, uh, on par with any other um, national collection, even, even those in Europe. So, um, so one of the most common ways to store collections is in jars. Um, and these are jars, it used to be jars of, of formulin, um, but typically it's, it's jars of alcohol. Um, and so this is, this is a, a shot from the um, David Snyder Museum um, uh, and uh, at uh, Austin P State University. And so it's very typical of, of the way, um, the way, uh, Many of the vertebrates are stored, um, and usually they're stored now in alcohol and ethanol um, because formalin has just been determined to not, be not a very good safe safe storage medium. Um, it, these are very flammable, though, um, and and so you know the most modern collections have state of the art fire suppression systems. Um, where I came from uh, at the University of Florida. The museum, the building in which the, 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 the alcohol collections were stored, has, it's, it's actively condemned by the fire marshal and everybody has to wear um, uh, name badges um, and sign in every day. Um, so that, I guess, you know, if the collections do go up in flames, we know who, who, who was in the building. Um, but, you know, so there, there is some risk there in terms of both losing the collection um, but that's the best way to store them. And it turns out that if you store collections in alcohol, you can still sequence the DNA out of them too, which is super cool because, um, and if you're familiar with sequencing technologies, they make pretty good, um, if, if you're using short read technology, it works very well on, 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 on alcohol preserved specimens. So if we go closer in, this is a shot 
um, of, of, of jar of, of bufo specimens, um, frogs. Um, and this is just typical of the way they look. They're, you know, um, either tens or hundreds of, 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 of individuals packed into a jar. And, you know, they're there. That means that someone was out in the, you know, woods somewhere, or out in a stream somewhere, collecting these things. And the effort that went into to gathering them and knowing what they are, labeling them, getting the catalog data is, is pretty significant. Um, I worked in, in, in um, you know, a herbarium for most of my um, uh, graduate career and, and, and before I got into informatics more. Um, these, are a, these are specimens of the hooded pitcher plant, Saracenia minor, um, from the Georgia herbarium. Um, and, you know, on the right side there is, is a distribution map showing, um, showing where the, the specimens um, occur. So, um, again, you know, very simple sort of geographic distributions, um, but ultimately of great value. If you go back in time, um, some of the oldest collections that we have in North America, um, these are plant collections. The, the old way of doing it um, uh, was to compile them in books, so not that much different from, you know, you pressing plants in a telephone book and, 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 and storing them up that way. But, you know, the bottom line is these, these are the uh, Douglas Houghton collections. Um, stored at the University of Michigan, um, and they represent specimens um, from the Great Lakes region that were collected between 1829 and 1831. So, you know, it's a pretty ancient record there. And if I may, you know, a lot of what, what, what the uses are of these specimens is we can tell, you know, from the collections if we know when they were collected, what month they were collected, what the date they were collected in. We can sort of trace back the phenology, um, the flowering times, the fruiting times, and that tells you a lot about, you know, what the climate might have been like in, in particular areas um, compared to what it is in, in, in modern times. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a record that is verifiable. You know, you have the physical specimen right there in front of you. Um, if it's not the same species as you thought it was, um, it can be checked. You can probably get DNA out of those leaves um, and, and, and sequence them. They've been able to get DNA from, you know, ancient DNA technology has, has gotten so good that, that you can now sequence things that are 100 years old. So there's, there's tremendous, not just historical value in these, but also scientific value in, in the historical collections. There are lots of collections, um, not a lot, but there are some collections from the Lewis and Clark expedition um, uh, in, in various places in North, Car North America. So at the Philadelphia Academy, for example, um, the, they probably have some of the best representations of Lewis and Clark specimens. But, you know, none of those, the collecting in, 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 in the North America and the U.S. started basically in the early to, to, to mid-1800s, um, not like what the collecting that was going on in Europe. So, the, you know, the organization, if you're talking about insects, um, you know, these are some of the most, this is the, these are the most biodiverse um, types of organisms um, or clades of organisms that, that we have represented. There are, you know, millions of, of species and millions and millions and millions of, of specimens of these things. But, you know, a lot of times they're not very well studied. They don't look, you know, th there aren't enough experts in the world to, to go through every specimen. So what, what can we do about that? A lot of them only have, you know, they're, they're determined only to genus or sometimes even family. Um, but, you know, the best we can do is the best we can do. So this is a drawer of, of, of neotropical um, uh, orchid bees. Um, and um, these uh, are at the University of Kansas Biodiversity Institute. And when you go, when you, when you zoom in close up um, to one of these things, um, you can, you know, the, the, the features on these are readily apparent. 
Um, these are euglossine bees. Um, this particular one is from Colombia. Um, and um, the interesting thing about euglossine bees is, 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 is these are orchid pollinators. They're, 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 they're attracted to specific scents from orchids. They're very specific to singular species. Um, and again, you know, this is, this is sort of like what's going on in Rafflesia. The, the euglossine bees are attracted to the plant, you know, thinking that the, the, to the flower, thinking that they're going to mate with the flower. Um, but they get the pollinia attached. And so a lot of the specimens, this is not one of them, have, um, they, they, they have the uh, pollinia attached to the hind legs there. So anyways, um, you know, with that sample, um, you can see that, you know, of, 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 the, uh, of the macro size organisms, you know, they can take up a lot of space. Um, there's a lot of storage um, uh, allocated to them. These are, these are slide collections, um, microscope side slide collections um, from the Yale Peabody Museum. Um, as we just go in a little bit closer, um, you can see how they're arranged in trays. Um, but you know, the, when, you, when you zoom in or when you go look at the individual organisms, you know, this is what you get. So this is a tardigrade. This is actually not from that collection. This is from the Fresno City College, um, for those of you from, from that area. Um, this is a, a, a tardigrade, um, and uh, it's, it's uh, worth noting that it has these very long claws, and, and the dorsal plates on this one are unpaired. Um, so I don't know if, that, if you know about tardigrades, but you know, they're the, they're, they're, they, you can, they, they basically can be reconstituted um, from being wholly um, dried, but uh, probably not this one because it's mounted in a slide. So you're probably more used to seeing um, uh, fossil skeletons because they always show up in newspaper articles. Um, so, but this is, this is not a dinosaur. It may look like a dinosaur. This is the holotype of, of an early bear um, from the Miocene um, in Orange County, Florida. So it's 20 million, 20 million years old um, at the uh, John D. Cooper Archaeological and Paleontolo Paleontological Society or Center. Um, so these are the sorts of collections that we've supported. Um, we, you know, we, as the, 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 the National Science Foundation has supported. Um, and I think the digitization of these has, has um, made the specimens a lot more available. But we have, we've also been supporting the, the, the living stocks collection. So this is, this is um, a, a green, green algae. Um, at the, um, at the um, culture collection of algae at the University of Texas. Um, these are potentially very useful as biofuels. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to know. We sometimes store these things for decades um, uh, without knowing their usefulness. Um, but if you don't store them, you'll never know. Um, and, uh, this is a diatom that also stores, you can see the, 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 the oils that are stored in those, in those, um, in those central areas there. Um, and like other diatoms, it has protective shells around them. Um, this is also from the, the University of Texas algae collection. So living stocks, anything from microbes, um, fungi, bacteria, um, but also um, little rodents. These are non-model org organisms, Paramiscus, um, at the uh, University of South Carolina Paramiscus Center. Um, and these are available, you know, for, for research use. Anybody can go in and order, order the stocks. Um, and for the most part, because they're supported by the National Science Foundation, they're available for research at, 
at you know cost recovery on a cost recovery basis. So what is it about these non-model organisms? You know, you're probably used to, you know, those of you in biomedical fields are used to hearing about um, data on mice or, or, or chimpanzees or other very commonly used organisms. Well, you know, not all the experiments that we do um, pertain to, to every organism on Earth. Um, and certainly not necessarily humans. So we need to look at what's going on in other organisms too. And so paramiscus is perhaps a new sort of emerging model, model organism. So beyond the, the living stocks, um, we also support cryo facilities. Um, so this is a minus, you know, just a normal minus 80 um, freezer. Um, but this is actually from the Fungal Genetic Stock Center. Um, so you can keep these organisms around. This is, again, a living stock. You can keep these organisms around for, for, for decades stored this way, as long as the freezer is operative. Um, the electricity doesn't go out. Um, so in, in some cases, it's better to use um, different sorts of storage um, uh, methods. So liquid nitrogen is one of the more common or more uh, commonly emerging uh, methods. And we, we've we been supporting a, a set of uh, farms of nitrogen tanks um, where you can literally store thousands and thousands of, of, of um, samples in these tanks. Here's a look down down into one of these tanks. And you know they can also use, they use robotics to retrieve the samples. Um, but anyways, again, you know, you're not liable to to well, you still need some electricity, but it can usually be provided by a generator um, to to make sure that the nitrogen um, stays charged. Um, so that's a facility at at, at University of Texas also. So on the, uh, not everything uh, is, is cold, so warm and fuzzy creatures. We support the, the, the um, lemur, the Duke Lemur Center. Um, and they recently, uh, they recently celebrated their 50th anniversary. Um, you may wonder again why we support lemurs, but again, you know, these are uh, non-model organisms. Um, we can learn a lot from, from non-model organisms. Um, they don't send out the stocks. You can't order one of these. Um, uh, but uh, you can go there if you're, you know, if you're a credentialed scientist or even someone with a good idea, perhaps, a student. Um, you can go there and, and arrange to, to study them. And um, there's some... You know, there's some really interesting research going on there. You know, they play video games. Um, but no, joking aside, um, you know, there's, there's, there's the opportunity to hear, to, to learn about um, cognition, um, uh, color recognition. This is, this, is, this is about, they have, you know, different sensing uh, visual systems. Um, and the, the, the experimentation going on here um, is really pretty, pretty incredible. You know, the 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 the, um, the novelty and and the creativeness of how these experiments are designed is is just amazing. Um, so again, uh, this has been going on for 50 years. I'm not quite sure how long we've been supporting the Lemur Center. The National Science Foundation has been supporting the Lemur Center. But the, the, the number of papers that have come out of this on, uh, you know, from anywhere on neuro, neuro, for neuroscience or behavior um, or, or even um, cellular, relation, uh, cellular biology and, and phylogenetics is, has been amazing. So there is a lot of work that goes into these collections. Um, as you might imagine, um, you know, if you have if you have a dinosaur bone or a, or a dinosaur skeleton, it takes years sometimes for them to uh, curate the sample, maybe even decades. 
Um, I've seen these casts. What they do is, you know, out in the field, they make casts around around the the, the finds, um, and then they bring them usually in, you know, under crates if they're big, um, back to the museum, and then it really literally takes years to continue to prepare to prep the samples and understand what's going on. So, you know, as, as you go back and think about, you know, the information that went into that phylogeny, that tree that I showed you earlier in the talk about um, the, the relationships among the dinosaurs, um, it's the years and years and years of, of hard work curating those specimens that went into um, uh, getting that knowledge, getting the data, getting the information behind that. So, by the way, you know, one thing that I learned working, working in, uh, at the University of Florida, there are a lot of retired dentists that go there um, and, and, and they volunteer at the museum um, doing work like that and they're very, very good at it. So it's a little different from, from, from grinding teeth, I suppose. But again, you know, it doesn't matter what, whether it's a paleontological collection um, or a fish collection or a herbarium collection. There's just a lot, you know, a lot of effort that goes into the preparation. Um, these are, the, these are um, larvae of the spade fish on the left, of spade fish on the left with different, different um, staining techniques um, where they're showing cartilage in blue, um, bones in red, and then, you know, rendering all the soft tissue um, transparent in, 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 in the top photo there. Um, so whenever the digitization of these sorts of specimens um, uh, occurs, there's, you know, probably hours of preparation that goes into um, each of these activities. Um, so it's a very intensive, it's a time intensive, it's a people intensive, activity. But it's also a learning activity for a lot of people. Like I mentioned, the dentists, um, but also students, um, school children really like to do some of this stuff. So um, it's, a, it's a great way to outreach to, to, to schools um, and, and kids. Um, this is uh, uh, from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. It's the Teen Science Scholars Program. So whenever we fund um, uh, an award, uh, we expect that, you know, the National Science Foundation um, expects not just the, the, the basic science to be funded, but we expect there to be broader, broader impacts too. And, and museums do a fantastic job of broader impacts, as you might guess. They have, you know, the opportunity to outreach to, to, to schools. They usually have informal education programs. And so this is an example of one of those. Um, so again, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that we've supported um, through the National Science Foundation. But, you know, our budget is really small, if you think about it. We put, in, for, for this particular program, um, the, the annual budget has been about 10 million a year, going to, you know, all those, you know, that variation of different, different sorts of programs, uh, different institutions, different types of collections. So, you know, think about it. $10 million is a fairly, you know, on the institutional level, it's a drop in the bucket. Sure, it's meaningful to each of us individually. Um, I would love to have $10 million um, in my back pocket, but I don't. Um, but it's not just actually the federal investments that have been going into collections. And actually, I don't know what the Smithsonian's um, annual budget is for, for natural history collections, but you know, it's, it's, it's probably on the order of 100 million to 200 million dollars a year. But the institutional investments um, from the universities, um, from private um, museums and herbaria, or nonprofit organizations, so like the Field Museum, um, the New York Botanical Garden, um, or, or universities like, like uh, uh, University of California, Berkeley, 
they've put millions and millions of dollars into uh, the facilities. Um, and we, of course, don't support the facilities themselves, but we support cabinetry um, and, and, and improvements. And basically securing and making available um, the data about the collection, so making it available for research and public public uh, consumption, and you know that's that's basically where we draw the line. But uh, it's a it's a fairly you know it's a it's a synergistic relationship. The institutions put in, um, I think, probably way more than we do on a national level or an international level. Um, but on the other hand, the funding that that, that NSF gives to um, especially small institutions, um, makes a huge difference in terms of, of the way they're perceived, those collections are perceived, the importance of the collections to their, to their administration. So that's something that, that I think is, is pretty worthwhile. So I did, you know, in, in, in the title there, I talked about dark data. And this is where the dark data is. Yes, a lot of those collections I showed you are um, uh, you know, they're, they're well managed, they have a lot of funding, um, the curation is, is you know, superb, um, and the specimens are, you know, very secure. Um, but a lot of collections look a lot like this, you know, and I will guarantee you there are rooms at the Smithsonian that probably look like this as well. You know, there are cabinets and cardboard boxes down in the basement there somewhere, um, without a doubt. Um, and, you know, that's their backlog. That's the backlog. And so this is, this is, this is the University of Alaska um, Museum. And I, I don't mean to call them out at all because, you know, this is just pretty much a status quo for any museum in terms of, of what they have or what they don't have. Um, but you know, these specimens, especially the ones in the cardboard boxes, are both inaccessible. Um, you know, you, you don't know what's in that box until you open it. Um, or, you know, it may have a label on it, but it's not going to be easy to find. And, and um, they're also at risk. You know, they're stored in cardboard. Cardboard re releases um, acids. Um, so you know, that breaks down the tissues. So what do we do about that? Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it takes funding to take care of those things. Those are priorities. Um, uh, and we all have to face priorities. So, um, but I think the value of collections is, is I think, something that, that is of societal interest. It's, it's of interest to science. Um, and, you know, there's a certain charisma about collections as well. But, you know, as with the paleontological collections, sometimes it takes, you know, years, if not decades, to discover what's going on. So, going back to the living stocks uh, collections, okay, probably, you know, I'm sure you're aware of, 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 of CRISPR-Cas technology. Uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technology for, 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 for doing synthetic biology. So why, what, what about collections? What's the link here to collections? Well, it turns out that um, the, you know, one of the plasmids um, that, that was used to enable um, the discovery of, 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 of CRISPR-Cas actually came from the Coli Genetic Stock Center at Yale dating back to the 1970s. So, yes, it was a paper that was published in the 1970s, um, and it took that long, you know, decades, before we actually recognized the value of what was going on there. So that tells you something about the potential value, and even potential econ economic value coming out of, out of, out of both the living stocks and also some of the 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 um, uh, some of the natural history collections as well. You know, if we can if we can somehow clone a woolly mammoth um, from uh, from a specimen, that's pretty amazing. 
So the CSBR, Collections in Support of Biological Research, isn't the only program that we have that, that supports collections at the National Science Foundation. One of the other programs that I run is Advancing Digitization of Bio Biodiversity Collections. Um, and the key here is, is that, you know, we're not doing that on an institutional basis where there is just a need to secure the collections. It's digitization based on research. Um, uh, you, you want the science drivers um, to be there, and, and you know, that's a review criterion of this, of, of this program. If they don't have um, a science question posed that, that is cause for digitizing collections, then they're not going to get funded. Um, and I'll say more, you know, as, as we go through the next set of slides here, I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that. But this program is, is designed on a hub and spoke model. Um, there's a hub called iDigBio um, at the University of Florida. Um, and um, they coordinate a lot of the activities. They don't, they don't actually do any digitization um, themselves, but they coordinate a lot of the, the, the uh, knowledge about how to do digitization and also a lot of the educational outreach. But the NSF program um, is, is a 10-year program. It's a, so we're in year seven right now. Um, once, once we, you know, do two or three more years, we'll probably sunset this program and do something different. Um, that's something that's pretty characteristic of NSF programs. Um, you know, some go a long time. So, for example, CSBR, the collection program, has gone on a long time in various forms. But um, this particular program to digitize um, has, has, has a lifetime, lifespan. Um, but the idea is to, to, to add to the body of digitized knowledge um, through, through thematic collection networks. And so um, a couple of the thematic collection networks that we've funded has been, one has been on, on lichens and bryophytes, and they're looking at, at environmental change questions. And another one looks at tritrophic relationships between plants and insects. Um, you know, as you know, you know, Insects feed on plants and they lay eggs, and they can be pretty impactful to, to agriculture. So the idea is to digitize um, all of the specimens um, uh, in the collections that are funded, in the institutions that are funded. Um, and the, the baseline here is that, that we're funding the digitization. We're, we're, we're asking them to pose a science theme or a question um, but we don't expect them to answer that question. That comes later. So what they're doing is creating a resource, a digital resource, that they can, that someone else or, or the same, same investigators can come back and later request funding to actually uh, answer the questions that they've posed. And we have another one um, looking at, <clears throat> at Lepidoptera. Um, uh, digitization as well. And all told, I'm just giving you a, a sample of a few of them. Um, uh, we've, we've, funded, um, we have, we've funded 16 active digitization networks. Um, but the impact on, 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 on the institutions funded has been huge, and we've funded um, collections in all 50 states at this point. Um, the the um, the coordinating entity, iDigBio, is, is, um, runs a portal, and you can go and, digit, and, you can go and download the 80, 88 million specimens if you want um, data on that. Um, you probably would not want to do that, but some people do. Um, and um, not all of those have images, but every one of those has some of the critical metadata that I talked about, a, a, a name, a place from where it comes, who collected it, and, and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, that's the sort of thing that you can start to do spatial modeling. And this, you know, as you, as you start to scale up towards that sort of infrastructure, um, you know, 88 million specimens, um, you need a lot of computation. You need, you know, it's, it's basically requiring cyber infrastructure on an institutional scale, on a, on a collaborative scale, um, 
that, that is beyond what most institutions alone can provide. Um, but, you know, this sort of cyber infrastructure is developed, you know, along with the needs of the community. Um, the, you know, the implementation and the prototyping is done all with input from the community and, and you know, with the, through the collaboration of computer scientists. So, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not your backyard garden type of database anymore. And then, you know, these groups also collaborate on a global scale. So you may have heard of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, all those specimens, those 88 million specimens, are also available through this um, portal. And this is this is this map is a little dated, but it shows you. You know, it's a heat map of of where the collections are from. Well, it tells a strange story because you can see North America and Europe and 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 Australia all lit up. That's not where all the biodiversity is, but that's where the information is. The biodiversity is probably along the tropics um, and, and perhaps in, in, in the oceans as well. So that tells you that there's still a huge gap in, in terms of our knowledge of biodiversity, especially in the tropics. So let me change gears a bit then and talk about um, so the, this is, you know, I'm from Florida, so I've always liked uh, studying um, uh, biodiversity in Florida. Um, I like getting out into the swamps and, and the sand dunes and, and, and interacting with alligators and things like that. Um, so, um, but uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Charlotte Germain, who's, who's a, a AAAS fellow at, um, at, at USAID right now, um, worked on a study to look at, um, um, uh, the, the, to take, to, to, to model species distributions based on collections um, and, and to look at change um, um, over time. Um, but, um, so this, this heat map shows diversity of, of, of about, um, 1,800 different species of plants. So Florida is known to have about 4,000 species of plants. And this, this represents 18, uh, 1,800 species um, that had at least 30 records of, of occurrences each. So, you know, roughly 400,000 specimens. Um, and shows that, you know, most of the diversity is, is along that Gulf Coastal area, but also the Central Florida Ridge there. Um, and and um, in the Panhandle, uh, also along the Gulf Coast. Um, but you know, I think what 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 really gets kind of interesting is using this type of modeling. They can also predict. Um, it's based on it's based on on climate models or climate um, uh, data, and you know, including temperature, precipitation, um, and and other sorts of of climatic data. But between now and, and 2050, their models are predicting that, that there's going to be a lot of change in terms of the habitats available to, to plants. So as you can see, you know, the, the areas that were green before are no longer green. But some, of, some, of the, some of the taxa based on this model would be moving um, north, uh, kind of into Georgia actually. And then other species would be moving south um, uh, down the peninsula, but you know the 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 the, the taxa that are in, in the central part of Florida would not find that to be a very uh, hospitable climate um, for them in terms of this model. So those are some of the sort of actually pretty basic things that you can do with the you know the specimen data that you get um, and. Um, as you start to understand the relationships between plants, then um, you can look at um, this is this is also from this is also Charlotte Germain's um, um, work, um, and in terms of of both the niche modeling, the, the species distribution modeling, um, and they they looked at phylogenetic phylogenetic diversity um, as well. So. Um, the, the, um, 
diversity is the higher diversity um, can be calculated based on each of the pixels, and then you can have a little you get a you get a cladogram um, showing what species are there as well. So th again, this is this is it's 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 innovative in terms of of data or using data that we one didn't have available to us even five or ten years ago um, and and using data that we still have a lot of gaps for so um, again um, it's a change in the way of doing doing uh, work in biodiversity but I you know a lot of the work in, in the sciences and a lot of the, the, the work that we're doing that we funded has been, you know, it's, it's single investigator work in the past. It's all been, um, you know, whether it's field sampling or species um, description, um, doing enumerations and monographs, you know, those are the things that, that a systematist, a taxonomist does. Um, but even in, in fields like neuroscience, um, uh, single investigators have been you know, the dominant uh, uh, way of carrying out research. And that's changing a lot now. Um, but um, there's still a lot of knowledge that, that has been gained this way, but there's still limits. You know, there's limit of, 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 in terms of, of, of how you can scale this out because it just takes, again, it takes a lot of people to do this sort of thing. And it takes a lot of com computation and data. So, as, as we move to sort of multi um, or collaborative research and also more integrative research, you have things, you know, we, we fund a program called Dimensions of Biodiversity as well. And, and this is really getting at the, you know, integration and, and interaction of, of um, the phylogenetic domains, um, genetic and, and functional. Um, and it, it involves research of, of, you know, it involves uh, doing high throughput phenotyping, if you will. It involves um, understanding organismic, um, uh, uh, organismic research in ways and function that in ways that, you know, we don't do in, in systematics. And again, so you just need a lot of people working on this. So whether it's, it's function and trees, um, or integrating with 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 um, uh, remote sensing data, um, it's going to take more than one person to do. Another huge advance that we're seeing right now is in doing CT scanning of specimens. Um, this is one of our our awardees from the University of Washington. Adam Summers has been doing an amazing job of. Of, of getting CT scans from, from, from fish. Um, one of the techniques they've developed is to, to um, roll up a, a, a bunch of pickled fish, usually small fish, into what they call, what he calls a, a fish burrito. And then they put this whole thing into the CT scanner um, and, and, and you know, the resulting scan, of course, has many different individuals of many species. But by doing that, um, they can, he can, he can just greatly reduce the number of, uh, the, the time that it takes to scan multiple species, you know. So instead of scanning one fish at a time, he's scanning 30 fish at a time. And, you know, that's, that's three or, that's, that's, that's a couple of orders of magnitude faster than doing it one way. And so the, the, the images that he gets are, are fantastic. Um, but, uh, you know, and I think we haven't supported a lot of this type of research. We've been supporting it kind of as a one-off thing. But, you know, as the cost comes down, you're going to see more of this. And what can, you, can, you can just, the, the, um, the types of research that we're seeing done with these types of, 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 of data are, you know, you can look at fluid dynamics, um, feeding dynamics of, of, of the individual fish. So, you know, it's just a matter of your imagination as to what you can do with this as a resource. And, and we're only now, you know, we're only now discovering 
what you can do with these type of data because you know they haven't been available. Um, we've talked a lot about um, funding things like the Brain Atlas. So this is this is this is a, an image from the Allen Brain Atlas. Um, but you know the investments that that go into um, uh, you know a brain atlas for different organisms um, is is uh, it's it's a very expensive investment. So you know the extent to which you could do this for you know non-model organisms is still a huge challenge. But um, I think there's there's a demand for doing this, and what what you get out of this is a collection of data, and so one of the challenges that we've been given is just to say how do we fund these born digital collections of data um, that are you know basically very expensive to to create and for that matter very expensive to to maintain as a data set so but the utility is is potentially huge so we're entering you know, basically a big data paradigm. So I don't know how many computer scientists there, there are in the, or data scientists there are in the room, but if you think of, of big data, the, the, they usually define this um, you know, along um, uh, four dimensions. So, uh, and, and the four Vs is, is the easy way to think about it. So the volume of data, um, the variety of data, um, the velocity, which means you know how fast you can compute over it, and then the veracity, because you know if garbage in, garbage out. If you if if you um, if you have a lot of uncertainty, a lot of noise in your data set, there may be no point in commuting computing over it at all. But you know, I think in terms of of, of biological data, um, the 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 big is not always just in terms of the volume, but uh, not the raw size. And as Dave, Dave Schimmel put it, um, who is a former chief neon scientist, um, that defining the aspect of e ecological big data is not in the raw size, but in another dimension complexity. And so, you know, part of what I've tried to illustrate to you tonight is that, that, that um, you know, biological data is way more complex than most anything that, that, that we've dealt with before. Um, and biodiversity data is, you know, if you think about it, the, the genomic data that we have um, that is, you know, if you just think of it in terms of sequences, A, T's, G's, and C's, that's really simple. But if you think about, you know, all this image data that we're getting, all the functional data that we're getting, um, and then trying to understand what organisms are out there is a, is a whole different challenge altogether. So, you know, I tried to think about the, those, those four Vs in terms of biodiversity big data. So, you know, even in terms of just the specimens, okay, so we have a billion or more specimens, um, a million to 10 million um, species. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of volume there. Um, and, and, What's been going on in the past is at a snail's pace um, compared to, to, to what we need to do today. Um, but you, ha you now have large scale sequencing and even high throughput phenotyping now. So this, this is a, this is a, a huge um, paradigm shift in terms of, of, of the velocity, in terms of the, the speed which would, with which we can calculate or um, uh, comp compute over these types of data. But again, there's still a challenge here. You know, the, the, we have both unstructured data, we have structured data. The morphology of, of these organisms is not well described. That's, that's where those ontologies come in. Um, and um, linking to abiotic data, environmental data, is, is just as challenging as well. So there's a huge variety of data um, that you get as part of this challenge. So, and then veracity. Well, collections are actually the gold standard here. If they're in a collection and you know what organisms you're talking about, you're, you, you, you've got a foot forward there. Um, but, you know, again, 
you know, I showed that heat map of from GBIF. It shows that there's a lot of missing data there. So I don't. We really don't know, but you know, my my ballpark estimate is that we're some 10 to 20 percent complete in terms of digitizing the collections that we have in house that we know about. Um, that's not very much, and you know, we just spent seven years funding more digitization, um, and yet there's a long way to go in both the U.S. and internationally. So, you know, I think that that so. NSF is, is, is the, you know, we call ourselves the innovation agency, um, and we have this little logo of, of, of uh, 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 where discoveries begin. And, you know, I think if you think about collections and observation, that's clearly a starting point. Um, but, you know, it's not always, it's not easy, it's not the most sexy thing that we've been doing sometimes, but, um, Observation is a key part of it. It leads to inquiry um, and leads to experimentation, but even more important, it leads to more innovation um, and development. And that's kind of a, to me, that's a life cycle. It's a life cycle of infrastructure um, and, and science in general. Um, so I'd kind of like to leave you with that thought um, and recognize that, you know, it's not just hypothesis testing, but also you know, the, the discovery-based inquiry that's also really important. So with that, I want to thank you and, and also um, uh, give acknowledgement to, to those of our awardees that uh, provided photos, um, pictures from their collections, and my colleagues at NSF um, who helped compile that, and then, and then some others. And so with that, I'd like to thank you. So we, we have time for a few questions. Um, there are people with microphones, and if you hold up your hand long enough for them to get a microphone to you, you will get to ask a question. So we'll start with Tim, and then we'll go to the woman with the, oh, if, when you get the microphone, could you please stand up, tell us if you're a member, and tell us your name. Timothy Thomas, I am a member of the society. I have a question about this 20% digitization. Um, I can imagine that for the metadata, but a single fly, you could have a tera, petabytes of data, given their DNA, the different morphologies, their transparency, uh, CT scans, all from a single specimen. So we couldn't possibly be at 20% digitization. No, not, 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 yeah. So when I refer to the 20% the, the digitization, I'm really talking about I don't want to call it metadata, but you know, it's the it's the very basic data about what specimens we have, sort of the the, the quick inventory of knowing what we have. Um, we so one of the one of the lines that we've drawn in the sand, if you will, in terms of of some of the digitization efforts is that we so as an infrastructure. Um, division, we don't pay for digitization that is done as part of the research. So, you know, up till now, the, any CT scanning that we supported has always been part of a research project. And so, I, does that does that help sort of sure, draw the sure. line? Yeah. You're um, but as the cost comes down, which, and and the speed with which we can do that. That might change, but we still have to be very strategic in terms of what we choose to fund. And the co it seems like this is a field ripe for robot innovation. Oh, there's plenty of that, yeah. Okay. Um, in fact, um, a couple of years ago, we, um, we, we held a competition. It wasn't very successful, but we had, um, we, 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 um, it was, what was it called? Um, but the, the competition was, in, in basically um, automating the digitization process. Um, it was called Beyond the Box, so it was for insects. Um, and there was a challenge described. And anyone that could basically digitize the samples, which were pseudo samples in this box, 
could potentially win up to a million dollars. Um, so nobody walked home with the prize, so it was too hard of a challenge. The woman in the burgundy, could you stand up? He answered my question. Oh, he answered oh, okay. the question? <laughs> Well, so th there are some things you can automate and there's some things you can't. And I think, you know, there, in terms of the expertise involved, um, and a lot, of, a lot of that expertise is, is, is retiring or literally dying off. Um, and, and, and that's unfortunate because, you know, we're, we haven't captured um, a lot of that knowledge. And that's... That, it's it's almost like the local and indigenous knowledge that we have um, in 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 uh, in communities around the world that is going to be lost forever. But you know, it's we can we there's only so much we can do as 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 one either a funding agency or as as a community. But you know, we do we do actually. Um, we do these things called transfers of ownership, and in some cases, if the uh, if if they've uh, if they've made the if they if the rationale is strong, that there will be use of the collection beyond what has gone on in some individual's lab, will support the transfer of ownership to a. A, 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 uh, in, an institutional collection, a permanent collection, if you will. Okay. I'm Jennifer Weller. I am a member. Hi, Reed. Um, so you mentioned that a few samples have been sequenced. Is that true from some of these collections? Um, or, or I mean, it, you sort oh of mentioned my, that might be associated data, but oh, there, there's there are a lot of. Not necessarily full genome sequences, but a lot of a lot of the. Uh, okay, so there's been a lot of sampling out of these. Okay, so are they yes. looking for the micro, the microbial sort of co-sampling? So I'm thinking that the, the microbiome changes over time as well, and if these samples were s stored properly, you've probably got a record of what that looked like at That's, the time of these samples but as well. You, you and just, I'm interested in that. You, you just nailed the problem, which is how the, how the specimens are stored. Um, the, well, okay, so um, I do sequencing, and it's not just how they're stored. It's also the bioinformatics aspect, which is if you throw out the random sequence that doesn't match the organism you think you're looking at, which happens a lot in sequencing projects, then you actually might be throwing out real data. So I'm just curious about how are people framing their questions and are they thinking about that? I, it's, it's thought about, but I don't know anyone doing the collection microbiome yet. Jerry? I'm good. I'm Jerry Hadasavich. I'm a member. Um, I guess in, in your uh, collections of biological samples, and then you have also the interface of GenBank and Barcode of Life and of how these voucher, so how do you interconnect all of these databases? Well, what interconnects those databases is actually the physical collections themselves. So Barcode of Life, those are linked to vouchers. Um, GenBank entries, if they're, the, the, the early GenBank entries did not link to vouchers, but the best practice in terms of, of, of GenBank um, deposition is now to include a reference to a voucher. And you know, the best way to do it would be to include a digital identifier, uh, a unique identifier. Um, that's starting to happen, um, but unique identifiers have to be persistent as well. And so you know, GenBank is, is, I think, as persistent as we get. Um, but museums have, you know, the, 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 the museum community, the standards people involved in the museum community have made a commitment, I think, to, 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 to long-term um, uh, persistent digital identifiers. So that's coming. 
But again, you know, I think the, the key is that those things link back to the physical specimen um, in some way, and, and, and the best practices are to do that. Up, 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 oh. up. <laughs> Preston Thomas, recording secretary, just um, for my information, um, could you explain voucher in this context? So a voucher in this context is, is, is a, a specimen in a collection that has the data about what it is, where it was from, who collected it, and you know when it was collected at the very least at the very you know that's the minimum data set that i think someone could call a specimen a voucher with some people relax the rules a little bit um, and and sometimes consider photos to be vouchers as well um, that's a judgment call um, i think you know we have to consider the fact that it's probably not very common anymore that you're going to go out and shoot an orangutan and put it in your museum. So, you know, a, a, a specimen might, I mean, a, a photo might just have to do. Um, so I think in that context, you know, it's, it's worthwhile um, relaxing um, what we consider a voucher. But it, would, it also, the, there, there are some people that also consider a, an expert um, observation to be a voucher as well. Um, and I'm not sure if I agree with that. I think you need something physical or at least digital um, uh, or, or a photographic representation. Any other questions? Ah, okay. Right there. Hello, my name is Nathan Coleman. I'm not a member. So you mentioned how there's some collections that are at risk of fire. And on the digital level, there's also risk of data loss from war, natural disaster, changing political climate. Is there an effort to make this data fully publicly available and replicate it between different countries and in the private and public domains? So NSF funds a project called Data One that does exactly that. Um, and I think you know the, the repositories like iDigBio and, and um, GBIF partner with Data One, and the idea is that Data One um, uh, replicates data across different subsets of nodes on a global basis. Um, whether whether it's really successful, um, you know, in practice is I think it's been around for about five to ten years now. It's one of, we funded it, NSF funded it as a, as a data net project. Um, and the, the real challenge for any kind of digital data, especially digital data funded by the National Science Foundation, is that we have, tend to have a five plus five year funding paradigm. So things are funded for five years. Um, if they don't have a means of becoming sustainable past that five years, we've got a problem. Now, Protein Data Bank has been funded for a very long time. GenBank has been funded for a pretty long time as well. So, but NSF really doesn't, you know, have a, a, a very good mechanism for what I would call archival data storage. Um, but you know, we're along with all the other agencies and, and on, a, on an international basis, I think that's certainly a topic of interest. But, you know, certainly in the bio directorate, we're not going to solve that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so last question. Uh, Carl can uh, have the last question. My, my name is Al Ehrlich. I am a member of the society. And, and I apologize in advance if you answered this question, but, and I missed it. But one reads regularly how many tens or even hundreds of thousands of new living species are discovered every year. How do they know? How do you cross-correlate with things that have been discovered earlier? Or is it just the guy who discovered it couldn't find a, another one like that? Well, so it's, it's experts. So the guy that discovered it may not even know. So I've collected plants. Um, 
in the rainforests of Borneo. And I had no idea I was collecting a new species until you know somebody was studying that specimen and then later told me, oh, that's a new species. So it's the expertise you know, at, at an institution, so people who have you know, dedicated their career to studying uh, single groups of organisms, they have the ability to, uh, to, 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 to um, make comparisons. And you know, usually that's been done on, on the basis of, of morphology, so physical characteristics. But now we can do it on the basis of, of, of gene sequences too. Um, so it makes it a little bit more, more readily comparable if you just sequence it. And you know, there's this tool called BLAST um, that allows you to compare um, any gene sequence that you have to all known gene sequences. And, and are, all these, are all these new things gene sequenced to a, to a greater or lesser degree? I think anything, well, no, not everything, no. Um, but, but the best practice now, so if, you, if you're doing modern field collecting, and, and you know, it's funded by the National Science Foundation, you probably better be doing um, tissue sampling along with sampling of the specimens so that you can get the sequences. I'm, I just want to clarify your question because it really conflates two issues. One is how do you know if something's new? And the second one is how do you know if it's a new species? So you can easily you know, go in the Antarctic and, and trawl up a bunch of uh, plankton samples and sort out all the copepods and, and look at them. And you could say, OK, well, this one's got a slightly different uh, antenna than that one. But you have to decide whether or not that makes it a subspecies or a species. And, and that's actually a difficult question. That's a difficult question. And, and it also, you know, the systematists have, have what they refer to as a species concept. And there are different types of species concepts as well. And I think that's what Larry's getting to. So um, there's a, you know, it's, it's a matter of, of, of expertise and judgment in part. But I think, you know, the technologies are getting better to do the comparisons as well. Yeah. Carl Merrill, a member of the society. I know there are international collections uh, of uh, seeds and plants that we use for agriculture that are essential for our human survival. Is that part of the, your, your system or is that a totally separate program? So, so USDA funds agricultural repositories. Um, so, you know, we, you know, as part of our mission, we try not to step on the toes of other agencies um, that have a mission to, to either fund agriculture or human health and disease. Um, so again, you know, we, we, we let them fund um, seed banks and, and germplasm repositories and that sort of thing. Um, and likewise, we don't fund disease-related research. So, you know, that's mandated by Congress. Last question. Hello, you talked, David Rosen, life member. Uh, you talked about gen preserving uh, collections of ge genomic sequences. What about karyotype data, like the numbers of chromosomes and so forth? Do, is that also collected? Is that part of genomic uh, data? Um, it is, but you know, they're, they're just, you know, it depends on, on whether whether um, the karyotypes have been um, have been archived, and um, in in you know, I would say that in most cases the case is not. But um, so it, it's. Does alcohol preserve karyotype as well as sequence? Does alcohol preserve karyotype as well as sequence? Um, I'm not sure about that. I'm guessing. I'm guessing not. But yeah, yeah. You wouldn't be able to prepare the karyotypes so you could actually see them because they'd all stick together in the alcohol. Was the answer. Okay. And I, I'll add that there are karyotype databases, especially for humans. Um, 
but they're not in the same uh, category as gene bank, which, you know, is much more universal depository for DNA sequences. I don't know of one that's on national scale for, for karyotype. There no, I don't know of one that's on national scale, but it's an interesting question. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, before you go, we have a little gift for you. Okay. So if we can move to the middle of the stage here so Carl can take a picture and everybody can see, uh, we have a framed copy of the announcement of your lecture tonight um, as a small token of our thanks signed by uh, members of the general committee, but not on our own behalf, but on behalf of the membership as a whole. Before we go, there are a few of the usual closing announcements. So the first one is, thank you. Thank you to all our members, sponsors, and supporters. PSW depends on enthusiastic, active, and capable members and supporters and on our sponsors. And without you, we wouldn't be able to continue to have these lectures, and we would not be able to grow. Please join if you're not a member. And if you are, please get involved in carrying out our activities. You can apply for membership on the website at www.pswscience.org and when you go to our homepage you'll see this but not that because that's past but you will see this and if you go down here you'll see the membership button which when you press it will call up our application for membership and when you get down to the bottom which I had to put up here because it wouldn't fit you'll get to the dues payment so if you're not elected your dues payment will be refunded but that's a pretty rare occurrence frankly in fact, it hasn't occurred yet. So if you will press this button, then you'll get to the dread PayPal page where you'll see PayPal, 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 and PayPal. And if you don't want to use PayPal, well, you're okay. You're not out of luck. If you look down here, you might see the continue, continue. And if you hit one of those continues, you'll get this page, which is a standard use your favorite debit card or credit card enter the usual information, and submit. And there are more PayPal things, but you can just ignore those. Why do we use PayPal? Because they're actually very kind to nonprofits, and they have very low fees for processing the credit card charges. And there has to be somebody who processes them, because banks have to make money, and PayPal is an inexpensive alternative for us. Our next, ah, I should remind you that PSW is a nonprofit educational organization and is tax exempt under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code. Contributions are tax deductible. If you have any questions about membership or contributions, please see membership chairman James Heelan. James around? I think he's gone over to the Fairfax to uh, make sure that we have chairs. If, uh, if, since he's not around, you can see corresponding secretary Robin Taylor, you can see our treasurer John Ingersoll, or you can see Preston Thomas, our recording secretary, or you can ask me, but you're better off asking them because, well, they know more than I do. If you haven't paid your dues, by the way, they were due a long time ago, so please pay. Our next lecture, number 2377, will be on April 7th, right here in the Powell Auditorium, and the speaker will be Eric Lindstrom, and he'll be speaking on viewing the Earth's stunningly blue and beautiful oceans from space, and what we can learn about them and about their role in climate and climate changes using the powerful remote imaging tools on NASA's constellation of Earth-observing satellites. We hope to see you then for what promises to be a very informative lecture. The rest of the spring schedule is now pretty much up on the website. The speaker on April 28th for lecture 2378 will be Anthony James, professor, mosquito expert, and molecular biologist at UC Irvine. He will be speaking on mosquitoes, synthetic biology, CRISPR 
gene drive, and malaria. That is, on the use of recently developed techniques for genetic modification to control disease transmission by the transmission vector. The 86th Joseph Henry Lecture will be on May 12th. That will be meeting 2,379. And this year we'll be having a series of four lectures on exoplanets, particularly potential, potentially habitable ones, with a dual focus on the trellis system, which has recently been in the news, and on broad cosmological considerations that inform us about habitable abundance in the universe. We'll be posting complete information to the website in the coming weeks, and we urge you to check the website regularly for updates to the rest of the spring schedule and for the fall schedule. The social hour ends at 10.30, so we better hurry up. After which, PSW members and their guests meet at the Fairfax Hotel Lounge just across Mass Avenue. If you want to join us, please speak with corresponding Secretary Robin Taylor, Vice President Lloyd Mitchell, or with me sometime during the social hour. Please use the side entrances to exit the buildings, the building, and I will now accept a motion for adjournment of the 2,376 meeting of the Society to the Social Hour. So we have a second. All in favor? The meeting is adjourned to the Social Hour. <laughs>